Aviation 2014 Forum. I would like to uh, say good morning and welcome you to this session. I hope you enjoyed yesterday's uh, sessions as much as I did. In, in the very morning, we had a panel on integration and interoperability that uh, was very informative and insightful. I think uh, we all appreciated hearing about the global perspectives on aviation's challenges and opportunities from our Brazilian and Chinese colleagues. And it was also very interesting to learn more about what's going to come next now that the FAA has selected the UAS test sites. Of course, at the end of the day, um, Axel Krein's William Littlewood Memorial Lecture was also fascinating. So, so I hope that you realize that in an effort to ensure that these variable se valuable sessions are available to all of you, if you happen to miss them, AIAA has archived these uh, sessions and they will be posted on the AIAA website so you and others can actually follow them. Let's see, frankly, when I see the different portions of the aerospace engineering community that come together for events such as this one, um, I can't help but marvel at the creativity, the ingenuity, and the hard work that gets put together to advance the state of the art and to ensure that we push the boundaries of the imaginable. And, and as a faculty member, a researcher, but also somebody who worked in government and continues to work with people of industry, I, I can tell you that it's, it is precisely this sort of intersection of academia, government, and industry that enables us to, to do great things and that uh, makes events like these ones must attend events for all of our, us in the community. Uh, I'd like to say something particularly for those of you in the audience that uh, have just recently graduated. Uh, I'm an educator, as you probably know, um, who have recently joined our professional community. I, I, we'd like to encourage you to take advantage of the opportunity to interact with colleagues, old and new. If you like a technical presentation, please go up to the uh, presenter and introduce yourself and establish a conversation. If you appreciate the opinions of the panelists, please go up to them as well after the panel and get a more nuanced opinion, perhaps. Also, if you have anything that you think, and this is mainly for the young people, that could be improved in any one of the ways in which we do things in these AIAA conferences, please feel free to come up to any of the members of the Executive Steering Committee or to any of the AIAA folks and express your opinions. So panels like the ones this morning on global supply chain are yet another great reason to be involved with AIAA and to come to forums like Aviation 2014 uh, because you do get to hear with, uh, from and interact with some of the best and brightest in our industry. I think while many of us worry about the design of an aircraft, perhaps the design of an engine, a spacecraft, a component, uh, and we think the work is done when we've selected some of the key parameters for these systems, the job is just beginning. In fact, significant uh, improvements in our bottom line require advanced methods and practices in manufacturing and procurement, in inventory, and in strategic coordination across these and various other functions of the aerospace enterprise. So just as we have challenges in other areas of aerospace, supply chain is being shaken by new technologies and processes. Take, for example, additive manufacturing, which you may know as uh, 3D printing as well, and advance in material sciences and metallurgy. Uh, these have enormous implications for global supply chains. In some cases, it's placing traditional suppliers squarely in the crosshairs, and in other situations, non-traditional suppliers are also encountering new opportunities. Uh, they're also developing new markets. So, these advances are driving structural changes. They're forcing OEMs to reconsider where parts should actually be uh, outsourced geographically. Uh, a typical example that some of you may have heard about is the 3D printing of the injector of the CFM Leap engine. So in this particular example, we went from having over 20 parts for a single injector to a single one, and this single part is actually printed on demand. So imagine the implications that that must have for the supply chain for the design and the construction and manufacturing of these types of engines. So while supply chains may not be at the top of your list uh, for some of us in various aspects of the engineering profession, um, this is a tremendously important uh, area that we would like to have some more insight into. So we have a great moderator today for the panel. Um, and we have some key aerospace supply chain experts that are going to talk to us about uh, this critical topic. Our moderator is Trevor Stans Stansbury. He's the founder, president, and CEO of Supply Dynamics, a subsidiary of O'Neill Industries, a $2.8 billion a year enterprise. Mr. Stansbury has been a pioneer in the area of extended enterprise collaboration and the design, development, and deployment of related multi-enterprise web-based solutions. 
At Supply Dynamics, he has helped leading aerospace, medical, energy, automotive, and industrial companies obtain real-time visibility and control over the raw materials and components that go into their outsourced parts. Prior to launching Supply Dynamics, Mr. Stansbury held a number of operating executive roles, including being the Director of International Programs and Risk and Revenue Sharing Programs at Honeywell International, and being the President of a trading company established by McDonnell Douglas Helicopter Systems, now Boeing Helicopters, specializing in the fulfillment of global reciprocal trade obligations. He received a BA with high honors in international relations and economics from Lynchburg College in Virginia. And he also has an international MBA degree from the Thunderbird School of Global Management in Glendale, Arizona. Trevor has prepared a short video to introduce the topic of supply chain to all of us here in the audience. And we'll roll that video as our panelists take their seats. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoy this session. Supply chains are being impacted by transformational forces. These forces are very disruptive, uh, but they're also serving up all kinds of amazing opportunities. The world in which we lived was once a fairly predictable place to do business. It's not that way anymore. The Web 2.0 comet has struck, and in today's connected world, new types of technology, businesses, and networks are quickly separating the mammals from the dinosaurs. There are three unstoppable forces that are transforming everything, and it's not so much the impact of any of these forces independently uh, that is so significant. It's the fact that they're combining in such a way to completely change the playing field on which companies operate. The first force is convergent technology, where the functionality of multiple devices is now being artfully combined into smaller and more powerful products and applications that can be used anywhere and at any time. The iPhone is a great example of this, but so is 3D printing. Not only will convergent technology change the way things are designed and manufactured, but new devices are revolutionizing the way information is collected and leveraged. A new era of big data has arrived. An ever-expanding wealth of information is being used to organize things in ever more efficient ways. Companies are using data not just to improve products and services, but to anticipate and predict things before they even happen. This phenomenon is driving organizations to ask, how can we do things better and faster than we've ever done them before? This leads us to a second force, business velocity. Companies are striving to make decisions and deliver results more quickly and with greater accuracy than ever before. The third force is one that we're all familiar with, globalization. Communication costs have become so cheap that it's as easy to do business with someone halfway around the world as it is the company in your own backyard. Because of these forces, it's a lot easier for a new market entrant to seriously disrupt a large incumbent's business than it ever has been. You can either ignore these forces or you can take advantage of them. Let's take a look at what some of the leading companies in the industry are doing today. Uh, particularly as it relates to getting on this big data bandwagon. Take for instance companies like Boeing, General Electric, John Deere and Caterpillar. These companies are leveraging information to increase their business velocity and effectively shrink the world in which they do business. They're learning to identify what types and quantities of raw materials are being used in what parts and which suppliers are making those parts. What raw material, component parts and chemicals are being purchased and from whom? What subcontracting relationships exist in and among their tier one, two, and three suppliers? And how efficiently are those relationships structured? How do part attributes match up to supplier capabilities? What's the market price for certain materials? And how does their price stack up to the prices being paid by others? The big question that every company needs to be asking themselves today is, have I positioned myself to succeed in this constantly changing environment? Am I leveraging technology and big data to anticipate the future rather than simply react to it? 
dinosaurs that once ruled the world disappeared because they were unable to adapt to the environment around them. This is not unlike the once unstoppable companies that most of us grew up with. Blockbuster, GM, Atari, Kodak, Palm, Circuit City, and the list goes on. You know, one thing's for certain. The future around the corner may look nothing like the present. And the only question is, what are you going to do about it? Well, good morning, gentlemen, and morning. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, the purpose of this panel is just to have a nice, casual conversation, just try to ignore the 2,000 people sitting here. Uh, they're going to eavesdrop a little bit this morning. These are really exciting times for the aviation industry. Uh, if you look at commercial jetliner deliveries, they're at historical highs. And despite some anticipated budget cuts in the defense industry, the long-awaited F-35 is, the ramp up is underway. So let's begin our session with a very general question, and we'll start with you, Duane. Uh, what are the three biggest opportunities that you see in supply chain today? Uh, I think uh, uh, the, the biggest one I see in the uh particularly in the aerospace industry. Uh, I just came from the defense industry for most of my career, so I've been the last, last year in aerospace, is, uh, uh, is the momentum that we're seeing in the aerospace in industry, the unprecedented uh, momentum that uh, I think presents some uh, wonderful opportunities for us to uh, have some synergy with other, uh, other suppliers that maybe haven't played in the aerospace industry before. Uh, for example, we're seeing um, companies that have been traditionally in defense uh, now come and ask us for uh, opportunities to play in the aerospace industry. Uh, I think that's very exciting because um, uh, they uh, traditionally, uh, a lot of these companies have had uh, outstanding performance in terms of quality and schedule but um, maybe not as competitive on the cost side of things. And so they're doing things within their company to become more cost competitive and, and uh, trying to compete in the aerospace industry. So that's, that's one area that, um, that we're very excited about. Uh, uh, more people to, to uh, do business with. The, uh, the business market is, uh, uh, is, is really unprecedented in terms of what the future might hold. Uh, we don't see any signs of that really slowing down immediately. The other, the other part of it is uh, the automation side. I think uh, uh, one of the things that struck me when I came to, uh, uh, to the aerospace industry is that a lot of things, when I interviewed out of college years ago, uh, they did have electricity when I got out of college, but uh, it was, uh, I interviewed with several aerospace companies, but I, I ended up going the defense route. But I noticed that a lot of the things hadn't really changed in terms of the way that we uh, manufacture and approach the business. And now, uh, with, the, with the industry going in the direction that it's going, there's a lot of uh, wonderful automation that, um, that we can take advantage of that maybe the industry hasn't been um, ta uh, looking at. Uh, robotics are much better now um, than when I was uh, when they were really first introduced uh, in the manufacturing in the, in the mid to late 80s. Uh, just the technology is so much more advanced, particularly on the manufacturing side. So both uh, for our company as well as uh, our suppliers, uh, we're seeing uh, a larger, more concerted, focused <coughs> effort into automation to uh, not only drive cost out, but improve the quality performance you know, through the repeatability of automation. So those are, the, those are some of the, the exciting things that I see uh, coming, um, you know, coming into this industry just uh, a year ago that, um, that make it very exciting to be in this business right now. Uh, it's certainly better than the alternative. You bet. Uh, on the downside. Kurt, anything you'd add? 
I, I agree with everything that Dwayne said. Uh, the only thing I would also add is uh, I, what I would characterize as data fusion, the opportunity where there is a tremendous amount of information out there and uh, not only integrating information between the supply base and, and the prime, I think we're at the you know, early stages of that and what that offers us, right, in terms of, of determining uh, performance uh, and, and defining uh, opportunities for improved performance, but also data fusion internal to, for instance, Lockheed in, in how we analyze the product health and, uh, and allow us to make uh, more near-term decisions on do we need to make design changes, do we need to make producibility changes, do we need to make what in order to improve the health of the product. So I think that's a, a budding opportunity that uh, uh, in my opinion, is yet to be fully tapped. Okay, guys, so let's flip the coin a little bit. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the, the two or three biggest challenges you face today. So I think uh, it, it's along the same line. So uh, uh, because uh, the business is uh, accelerating and uh, uh, rates are increasing, uh, really for all of our customers, you know, at Spirit, um, the challenge there is to uh, make sure that uh, not only are we ready internally to accommodate those rate increases, so they're good problems to have, but also is our supply base um, uh, ready for these rate increases. And um, so, we've, so we've seen some, uh, some issues where uh, maybe our supply base was uh, sort of at their peak of their capability in terms of rate uh, in the previous rates, and now when we uh, throw on these accelerated rates, um, they're, they're struggling to meet those rates. And it's not only just a rate, but it's also a quality uh, issue. Uh, maybe they were kind of on the edge, and then the rate uh, increase exposed uh, additional issues that uh, they didn't know were there, and we didn't know were there either, and both of us should have known that. Mm. And so, um, you know, nothing too serious, but as, but as these uh, rates uh, begin to increase, and, and particularly if they, if they take another jump and increase, it's, it's really uh, making sure that the supply base is ready for these, for these increases. So part of that is what I was talking about before, uh, making investments in technology that's going to, uh, going to enable those rates, but really looking farther ahead um, uh, down the road uh, to enable that. The other thing that I would, I would say is, um, on the, on the design side, um, you know, we still see issues, um, and I saw this in the defense side of the business too, that where the, um, uh, the designs uh, coming out of our engineering organization uh, weren't always uh, designed for producibility, for manufacturing. Um, and as you see, over the years, uh, a, lot, a large part of our manufacturing uh, going outside of the company, and that's been, uh, that's been going on in the, in the industry, in the defense industry, that happened a long time ago. Uh, in the aerospace industry, you're starting to see that too. There's a large percentage of our cost is what we buy. The, the issue there is um, um, the design engineers aren't as exposed to manufacturing as maybe they, they used to be. So it's harder, it's a little bit more complicated to get a design that can be manufactured and can meet the cost objectives. And, uh, and, I, and I worry about that. I, I'm mm. concerned about that because there can be a gap there. It's uh, easy to design something, it's not easy, but it's easier to design something that can work and function. It's harder to design something that can actually be manufactured uh, easily and cost effectively with a good quality product. So, so I, worry about, uh, I worry about that. So, Dwayne, it sounds like you're starting to see some stress in the supply chain related to the up, the up cycle. A little bit. Uh, um, would you agree that uh, we're a lot better off than we were in the 99, 2000 time frame in the last up cycle where the supply chain problems were just rampant with Boeing and Airbus? Uh, yeah, I didn't live through that personally, but I watched that and uh, experienced that in the defense side of the business. Uh, yeah, I think it's, uh, it's not a... Uh, it's not a panic situation at all. Um, and, and the good news is, is that there are other uh, very capable uh, suppliers out there to help complement uh, any issues that, uh, that might come up. So I don't, I don't see it as, a, as an overly serious issue, but uh, you, really, you really want things to run smooth, yeah. smooth as possible. The expectation now 
is that everything runs smooth and everything is perfect. Right. It may not always get there, but that's what we that's what we drive for, and that's what we expect. And so, so it's really striving for that perfection, that smoothness, uh, making sure there's no disruption to our lines, um, because any kind of disruption really causes a. Uh, uh, an issue for uh, for any uh, manufacturing line that's gotcha. that, that's uh, it's Kurt, your there. turn. Um, so I think there are uh, three challenges that that worry me. Uh, uh, the first is uh, uh, our first tier suppliers management of their sub tier suppliers. If you look through uh, you know the data that we get, uh, a lot of disclosures that we get, uh, the root cause is not at our first tier supplier. It's really and maybe a second or a third tier supplier that's causing an impact to quality, it's causing an impact to the ultimately delivery. So those things worry me, you know, and, uh, and, and concern me in terms of what can we do to improve uh, that management uh, uh, discipline throughout the, the supply chain. Uh, in addition to that, uh, uh, of course, affordability is key, uh, both in the commercial side and the defense side. And, uh, and I don't find, uh, or I find oftentimes that uh, uh, our suppliers who oftentimes have 60% of their costs coming from their sub-tier suppliers uh, could do a better job controlling those costs, mm -hmm. aggregating requirements, doing things that, uh, that provide better value ultimately to the customer. So that's, that's a challenge I think we've got to go face and, and address. Um, secondly, uh, particularly in the defense industry is, is uh, strained budgets, right? Both. Uh, uh, from the, the U.S. government's perspective, and but also from uh, the international uh, uh, communities where they have fiscal challenges. Uh, how that translates to the supply base, of course, is it creates uh, some degree of instability, right? What's the future look like? How do you go address it? Uh, and with instability, uh, there tends to be less risk-taking, right? And, and so there's negative consequences to that, right? Uh, are people willing to go invest? Are people willing to uh, uh, take a challenge in terms of uh, uh, cost improvement over time or quality improvements over time when they really don't know that the business exists? And so the lack of stability is, is a concern uh, for me. Uh, and then the, uh, uh, the third uh, area is some consolidation that's occurring in the industry. Uh, and you see it in terms of like machine shops uh, where uh, traditionally, some small businesses, well-run small businesses, are being acquired, uh, probably in, in light of the boom in the commercial industry, right? So they see an advantage, but they're being acquired. Uh, and what we find is a, a couple effects from that. Number one is during that transition after they've been acquired, we tend to lose some performance mm. uh, for whatever reason. They lost the, the recipe or, or uh, you know, they're just management uh, techniques or in, in processes are different, but uh, we send, tend to see some down uh, turn in, in, in performance out of that. But then secondarily, and particularly in, in the defense industry, uh, we lose an opportunity to deal with small businesses, which, you know, certainly uh, we try, uh, you know, uh, to do our best in, in, in applying dollars to a small business, and that, that tends to, to uh, be diminishing with these consolidations. So, Kurt, with the uh, with the with, with the uh, uh, the trend towards consolidation, where you have these acquisitions and the growth of these larger and larger tier one and two suppliers, mm -hmm. does this signal the end of the mom and pop shop in aerospace? I don't think so. Uh, uh, I think that there's always going to be an opportunity, right? Uh, it may be a smaller niche. Uh, but I think there's always going to be an opportunity for uh, a mom pop shop to uh, to come into play there. Actually, you know, there's kind of a mixed bag on 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 dealing with those types of suppliers, those small businesses. Ten, they tend, uh, in my history, would say that uh, they tend to perform very well. You always have to worry about their fiscal health, mm -hmm. right? You always have to worry about is it a, a one-person shop, a two-person shop, and and if that person uh, you know, were to leave the company or something happens, what happens to the performance of that supplier? But overall, I would say they're very dependable and easy to deal with. And so I think there's always gonna be room for that uh, uh, in the long run, but, uh, and so I don't see, it, uh, don't see it diminishing. Great, anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, if I was to give some advice to companies that are out there acquiring uh, other businesses, uh, particularly in the machine shop, and there's a few that are very aggressive about that, is it's really what Kurt was saying is uh, um, there's really, uh, I've seen very, very poor transition 
plans or really no plans in many cases. So, you know, the company gets acquired and uh, the, the previous owner or ownership, um, maybe, uh, maybe not because they want to, but uh, because they have to, they leave. And although the recipe to make the product may still be there, the, the cadence of how the company ran and how they dealt with their supply, mm. with their customers, and just the personality of the company completely changes overnight. And that's a, that's a hard thing for, for us to, uh, to, to watch. Mm. And so, as Kurt said, we, we see um, uh, some, some real gaps. So um, I, think, I think they could do a better job of transitioning those acquisitions mm -hmm. and, and, um, and planning out how they're going to do that. Um, and uh, that's just be my observation. So I don't know that they'll, anyone will listen to me, but I think that's, uh, you know, we've seen that happen three or four times just in the last year uh, with some acquisitions where they, uh, uh, you know, we noticed a big, big gap in performance. It Great. eventually came back, but there's really no reason for that gap to Interesting. Occur. You know, I think it's, it's like anything. When change is introduced, right, uh, there's always risk, right? And, and so, you know, to Dwayne, I think we need to, and we have taken some, uh, you know, more proactive steps to try to really go in and understand transition plans, really to see if, uh, if uh, we can assist in, in, uh, in trying to mitigate that. Uh, that, that risk. All right, guys, so I'm going to ask you to pull out your crystal balls a little bit here. Uh, Richard, uh, Richard Abulafia once called cyclicality our forgotten nemesis, and it's great that times are good. Uh, some would say that the current boom in aviation is due primarily to two things, right? Uh, high oil prices and low interest rates, which obviously makes financing of more efficient and more profitable airplanes much easier. Are we in a bubble? So I, uh, so people probably smarter than, than I could, could answer that question. Uh, uh, I would say that uh, the, way we, the way we should approach that is if you, if you look at where we are at this particular time, um, it doesn't feel like a, it doesn't feel like a short-term bubble. Uh, you know, usually these things do, even in defense, you know, these things are cyclical and sometimes aerospace and defense are counter cyclical. Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't feel like a short term bubble to me. It feels like it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, it's an increase, a steady increase, a thoughtful increase. Um, there's always world events and those kinds of things that, that could pop that bubble. I don't believe we'll see. Uh, the same kind of reaction if we ever had one of those like we saw, you know, back in 9-11. But I do think that um, uh, uh, it's incumbent on us as companies to, to think through that and take advantage of these times and, uh, you know, make the investments uh, in our company uh, so that inevitably when, when the cycle does slow down, that, you know, we're prepared, you know, we're competitive, we've got, uh, we've got the right... Uh, people in place and the right expertise in place uh, to, to go through the slower times, and they will come, mm -hmm. and, and then come out at the end of that cycle uh, even stronger than ever. And I think that's a lot of times what companies uh, forget to do. It's easy to just uh, to get so focused on the rate increases and those type of things that you forget to, to invest, in, invest in the people and invest in, in, back into your business. So I don't think it's a short-term bubble, but and that's but good knows? advice. Who so knows? one eye on the present, one eye on the future. Kurt, yeah. would you agree? Well, I, I would say this. I, I guess history would tell you you're in, we're in a bubble. And now maybe the question is how big the bubble is, right? Mm -hmm. And to, so to Dwayne's point, I think uh, seizing the moment and, and taking advantage of, uh, of uh, the opportunities of, of being in the bubble and, and focusing on on human capital and and uh, and other capital uh, within the industry is uh, is a very valuable thing to go do and, and to uh, not only execute what you currently have but prepare for the future. All right, guys. So this is also a time of uh, great fiscal austerity. It seems to be the watchword on Capitol Hill. Uh, some see that the states are playing a more proactive role when it comes to supporting or incentivizing aerospace investments. Uh, you have new Boeing facilities in South Carolina. You've got Airbus opening up facilities in Alabama. And of course, in March, United Technologies announced a collaborative partnership with the state of Connecticut. And I think you're going to invest something like $4 billion. Uh, 
So, so what's going on here? Are, are these things impactful when it comes to your supply chain? Uh, do you see this as being a uh, significant transition uh, with the uh, federal government spending less, but the states playing a more active role? What's your perspective here? Uh, yeah, I think the, uh, I think the states are, are being, um, uh, some states are being very uh, competitive and very aggressive about getting uh, companies to come into their, uh, into their states and, and offering uh, attractive incentives, uh, you know, not, uh, not just at the, at the prime level, but the tier one and the tier two level. Interesting. I think that's something that, I, that you know, maybe we haven't seen so much before is, is going uh, uh, lower down into the supply base. Mm -hmm. And so they're they're, uh, they're, there's now incentives for, for, for smaller companies, mm -hmm. relatively smaller companies to come in. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, uh, uh, it's something that we're always watching. A few years ago, we put a, a large facility in North Carolina, um, you know, and so uh, we're always looking at, uh, at opportunities uh, uh, to do uh, low-cost manufacturing, and, uh, and I, I, I do see a little bit more aggressiveness, uh, both on the defense and the, and the aerospace side. I, I, I mean, I, I agree with what Dwayne said, I'll, although I would say this, I don't, uh, you know, from our direct supply base and, and working on the C-130 program, I don't know that we've, you know, uh, had any direct suppliers that have taken advantage of those, uh, those states, uh, uh, you know, taking a more aggressive position to, uh, to incentivize uh, a business transition, uh, although you do see it across the supply base. And I think it's, it, you know, it's clearly an indication that the states are stepping in. They're, they're trying to figure out their way uh, to create a more healthy, you know, economy within that uh, uh, that territory, uh, and I think ultimately that that uh, will be positive, uh, you know, to the primes that are buying from. Them. All right, guys. So let's turn a page here and let's talk a little bit about innovation in the aerospace supply chain. So in our industry, there have been no shortages of innovation on the design and the engineering side of the house, and I think that's something of great interest to the folks in the audience. You can look at uh, 3D printing, you can look at the migration of ceramic and composites into airframes and turbine engines. Uh, you can look at monolithic design innovations. Um, are the engineers the only folks that are, that are making hay these days? Um, what, what are the most exciting and transformational things that you observe on the operations and supply chain side of the house? So I, so I think f from my perspective, I think um, um, the, uh, the, uh, so the automation um, opportunities that we're seeing that are co that's coming from the industry are, are very exciting. And uh, there's a lot of things that um, uh, traditionally um, uh, have been really hard to automate. Um, some, uh, ha you know, uh, very, very labor-intensive hand-type operations, layup operations, those kinds of things, that now there is technology out there uh, that will enable you to do that mm -hmm. and, and give you a, a much better uh, product quality than, than, than what we had before, and hopefully at a lower cost. And so I think, uh, I th I think uh, automation to me is very exciting. I think 3D printing uh, is a, is an, a very interesting thing, an exciting thing to look at. Uh, clearly, I think it has its place in the, uh, in the design side. And getting back to my comment earlier about designing something that can be manufactured uh, uh, easier, uh, I think that enables that process and that fills some of the gaps that we were talking about. Uh, so, you know, I've, I've seen where 3D printing has actually uh, enabled the design engineer to, uh, uh, to design something better and to uh, and, and get the manufacturing guys uh, more involved, just because I think the manufacturing guys are just really interested in what 3D printing is, right? Mm. And so it's uh, uh, so yeah, those so those two things are are to me are are very very exciting on the automation mm. side. Uh, you know, uh, I think the one thing I would add, and kind of tying on with what I had said earlier uh, about uh, this data, the data fusion, and so within supply chain, you know, as an example. Uh, What's really encouraging to me, you know, if you look at it from a tactical perspective of how we manage the supply base and the information that we're now having available at the buyer desk, information that we have at the program level to really assess the health of the product, where we integrate it and, and view it, uh, you know, more in terms of, of a, a holistic view on, on uh, product performance 
uh, again, uh, to allow us to drive decisions on, on do we need to make changes in-house uh, to uh, improve the health of the product? Do we need to make changes at the supplier to improve that or make changes in the field, right? And, and so the, the ability to collect data uh, to drive decisions to me is uh, something that's it's, uh, transformational uh, from the perspective of subcontract management. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of talk today about uh, about the dawn of the big data era, mm -hmm. and uh, do you actually see stakeholders in the aerospace supply chain using this data uh, to improve efficiency? I know there's the GE has touted this. Uh, the I think they call it the industrial internet, where they're monitoring the heat of parts that are running in the engine, and they're broadcasting that information so that you have real-time analytics and you can use it predictively to, to understand when you would have to overhaul an engine. Do you see similar things elsewhere in your supply chains where data is being harnessed to do things that you could never do before, certainly on a predictive basis? Yeah, I, th I think uh, it's same thing. I think we see it you know, in our propulsion uh, 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 teammates uh, on uh, some of our platforms that they're using those types of that types of information. Uh, I think we're probably at the early stages of it, right? There's st uh, still a long way to go and, and, uh, and to fully uh, appreciate and maximize the benefit of it, but uh, we do see parts of that uh, throughout the supply base. Dwayne, you seem to be implying that uh, maybe with automation, is, is the aerospace supply chain becoming more robotic in nature? Uh, not as much as uh, I'd like to see. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, I think, uh, and I don't mean just robotics, but I mean uh, just, just automation in general, right? It doesn't always have to be a robot. Um, and, and just going back to what Kurt was saying, I think, so, you know, the product he manufactures versus the product we manufacture, there's, there's, a, there's a, a significant level of sophistication difference. You know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, he builds a platform, we build fuselages, primarily wings. But I think that uh, certainly our customers are doing a lot of the big data things, and we're following it. Um, we're following along and, and, uh, and, and trying to play where we can play. Um, but yeah, I think the, uh, the, the automation side is, um, uh, is, a lot, is a lot more affordable than uh, uh, many people realize now. And it's much more available and abundant. And uh, uh, so I think that uh, uh, we're trying to encourage our suppliers to, uh, to look into that. And so we're giving them we're, we're giving them help, and we're doing some things internally now too. And I think it's all because uh, uh, because the the industry is doing better, and I think that uh, people are seeing that hey, now is the time to invest and 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 do these things because uh, uh, some things uh, some things just haven't changed uh, you know over the last 20, 30 years, and they need to change the way we're the way we're manufacturing things. Okay, so it's shirts and skins time. <laughs> there are a lot of moving parts in a distributed supply chain, as we all know. And uh, because there are a lot of moving parts in a supply chain, that makes it a very interesting place to work, but also a very challenging place from time to time. Um, so if you look at planning and logistics and purchasing and aftermarket and manufacturing, what aspects of your supply chain are the most challenging to manage? So this is probably the same for both of us, but uh, maybe, maybe not, I'm, I'm pretty sure it is. Uh, what, what, what is challenging, I think, is the, uh, it, so I'm gonna sound like a traditional supply chain guy here, is really the quality, the, the product quality. Um, it's so disruptive to our lines, and maybe historically there had been some level of acceptance for escapes and that kind of thing. But uh, nowadays, there's, there's zero tolerance for mm. that. There's absolutely zero tolerance for any kind of escape. And I think um, the, uh, uh, so we have, we've worked very, very hard at Spirit, and I know, Lockheed, you've done the same thing to uh, every industry to, to really drive product quality. Uh, the, uh, the level of sophistication, and Kurt talked about this, uh, within our supply base, uh, is, is lacking in many areas in terms of managing their own supply base, in terms of understanding uh, what, what, what they're getting in and then what they're passing back on to us. And uh, that level of sophistication needs to increase. Doesn't mean the cost needs to go up necessarily, but the, the uh, monitoring 
uh, what's going on. Things that uh, uh, they used to take advantage of and buy off certifications and those kind of things just really don't work anymore. Uh, you know, you have to get involved with your supply base, uh, do uh, product audits, do those kinds of things, get more engaged with the supply base, just like our customers do with us. And that needs to transfer down into the supply base with our suppliers. So, you know, as they're growing and as they're doing more work, their level of sophistication in managing the supply base also needs to improve. And so we're really encouraging them to do that. And those that have accepted that challenge and have taken on that challenge, uh, they get more work from us because we have more confidence in what they're delivering to us. Kurt, would you agree? I mean, is it supplier, supplier quality assurance is priority number one? Uh, absolutely, I would agree with it. Somebody once told me early in my career is quality drives schedule drives cost, right? And, uh, and so, uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, I can know, I know in our industry, uh, you know, we have a tremendous amount of uh, turn a product, you know, once the product comes into our factory, we measure it, we call it stick rate. You know, how often does the product come in, uh, get inventoried, get kitted and, and released to the factory floor and actually stays on the airplane through the, the delivery of the product. And you'd be astonished to know how frequently product comes off the airplane prior to it being uh, delivered. It causes a lot of inefficiencies. And as someone once told me, uh, the only only companies that make out on that are uh, are FedEx and, and UPS, right? Mm. Because the parts are constantly moving, mm. for for whatever reason. And so, you know, where you can gain a tremendous amount of cost efficiency is improving, you know, that quality, that first time quality, uh, driving it throughout the entire supply base, as, as Dwayne and I've mentioned before, uh, and uh, and that generates uh, you know a greater affordability. So in the, in, the, uh, in the icebreaker video that we played before we began this panel, uh, there was the assertion that, uh, that, that companies don't compete against companies anymore. Supply chains compete against supply chains. Uh, it, it referenced the role that an original equipment manufacturer like Lockheed or Spirit Aero Structures would play uh, in working collaboratively with its tier one through tier N suppliers on purchasing and supplying common materials. Um, this seems to be increasing. So if you look at the world in which we live today, you see not just companies like Boeing and Cessna uh, and GE doing this, but uh, even companies like John Deere and Caterpillar basically choreographing interactions throughout that extended supply chain. So we spent 20 years outsourcing the majority of what used to be made in-house, and today there seems to be a lot of, of, of focus on how do we connect the dots in that distributed supply chain to make things run more efficiently. Do you have examples of this from your own supply chains? Do you see this as, uh, as the future of supply chain? Yeah, I do, and I think, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's, uh, uh, Kurt probably isn't as old as I am, but, uh, you know, as, as I watched, as I've watched over the years, this transition that you've, that you've talked about where, where the primes have basically uh, built everything from scratch, used to make, uh, build everything from scratch, and uh, bought only raw material to where uh, anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of their, of the total, uh, product cost is now bought out in the supply chain. I mean, it's a very exciting time to be in supply chain. And I don't see that, I don't see that dynamic really changing. Mm. Uh, the only reason why that would change is if the supply chain doesn't perform, you know, and so the larger companies, uh, you know, that have resources could choose to bring some of that back in. But normally, um, I, I think the, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an exciting uh, time to be in supply chain. It's, uh, you know, back in the olden days, it was more of a procurement-based type effort, supply chain was, you know. Now it's, a, now it's really a management, almost a program management kind of thing. Uh, you, have to, you have to manage the whole chain. Uh, you have to influence companies that you, you, don't, you don't belong to. You're not on their boards. You're not in their companies. But you have to, as a supply chain professional, you have to go in and manage that and influence them and, uh, and hopefully make them do what you want them to do and uh, understand that they have other customers too. And so it's, there's some real skills that are learned in this, uh, 
in this process that I think uh, uh, are really not learned anywhere else uh, in, in any of our companies. And so my view is, is if, you're, if uh, to be a supply chain professional uh, right now at this time can really position uh, someone uh, into uh, uh, more senior management roles because of just the broad base of what they learn. And so, yeah, I think it's, uh, I, I mean, I've seen that happen a lot, and uh, I, I don't see that slowing down. I think it's going to continue that way, and I think, I think that's good. I think that's, uh, that's an exciting thing for the whole industry. That's an exciting thing for new companies. Um, and it's exciting for, for us that are, that are buying all the, pro all the products on the outside. All right, so I'm going to ask you to stir things up a little bit, and then we'll go back to you, Kurt. Dwayne, if you've got to hire somebody to work in supply chain, who are the best people? The people out of finance, people out of purchasing, people out of engineering? Do you have an opinion? Uh, I do. Uh, I, I think it depends. It does depend on what you're asking them to do. But if you're asking them to do what, uh, what I just talked about, which is subcontract management of the supply base and uh, really getting out there and making sure that they perform, uh, you know, I think. Um, uh, there, there isn't, there isn't an answer. I've seen, uh, I have seen, um, I have seen finance guys be successful at it. Uh, I have seen uh, maybe a handful of engineers be successful at it. Uh, I'm an engineer, but you know, it's uh, uh, maybe less so because uh, engineers think a little different. Uh, not that it's bad; they just think different. Um, and I, but I, but I have seen um, uh, guys who. Uh, who uh, I've seen guys come from program management be extremely successful in supply chain, or guys who have just started in, 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 a, in a program office and then move up into supply chain. I've seen them do very, very well on the subcontract management side of things. Um, and then, and then the, the schools are putting out, uh, that focus on supply chain right now are putting out some really, really excellent uh, talent right now. And so, you know, uh, supply chain as a career, you know, even starting as a career is not a, is not a bad thing. It is a, it is a profession into itself right. that I very, very much appreciate. And I think it maybe hasn't been thought of that way in the past like it has now. Kurt, you want to weigh in? So we were talking about, uh, you know, is the future a future in which <coughs> original equipment manufacturers dictate sources and prices of materials on behalf of their extended distributed supply network? Yeah, I think actually there's a, a, a couple things that could happen in that. And, and in fact, we do some of that right now. You know, from a perspective of collaborating with the tier one and maybe to some extent tier two and tier three, uh, you know, we do aggregate raw material requirements. Sometimes if it's a, a high value like forging, we might buy it, uh, aggregate those requirements for the whole, buy it and supply it to the supply chain to, you know, derive quality benefit, cost benefit. Uh, of, oftentimes, we aggregate those requirements and, uh, and negotiate uh, uh, terms with a supplier uh, that provide provisions right to buy, provisions to the supply base. Again, it, it gives a consistency of quality. Oftentimes, those, so, those suppliers are all qualified suppliers. That's a good thing. Secondarily, again, in the defense industry, if we go to one source, they tend to accept certain DFAR provisions like specialty metals, and, and it tends to lessen the opportunity for those uh, disclosures to occur. That's a positive thing. And then often, oftentimes it stabilizes the price over, over a period of time. So we do those type of collaborative items. And, and if we, in fact, we form strategic partnerships with large companies like a, a Boeing or a General Dynamics like we did in F-22, like, we'll aggregate those very specific commodities uh, and go out to the supply base and, and, and try to take advantage of, of those same benefits I talked about. Great. Um, so. I, want to, I want to leave a few minutes now for the audience to ask some questions, so let's go ahead and do that. I know we have some mics out here. If there's anybody in the audience that would like to, ad to uh, address a question to any of our panelists, this would be the time to do so. Any questions from the audience? Don't be bashful. Okay, it looks like we have one here on the front row. Hello, uh, my name is Elizabeth Tain. I'm a PhD student in uh, Georgia Tech, studying aerospace um, engineering, uh, particularly aircraft design and um, 
supply chain integrations. So um, one of you mentioned that uh, one of the issues that you think um, is uh, the designers uh, may not be as exposed to manufacturing aspects anymore because of a, lot, a lot of things are done uh, externally. So I was wondering what your solutions may be uh, for that, to solve that concern, problem issue. Yeah, so uh, thank you for that question and, uh, and, uh, uh, and I'm glad you're going into this, uh, uh, to this part of the business, it's very exciting. Uh, get out into the supply base when you're, when you're out designing a product and chances are pretty good, you know, there's a 70-30% chance depending on what your split is, you know, what you make inside and outside, that it's gonna, that it's gonna be manufactured outside. Get out into the supply base and, and, and by the way, they, uh, you'd be surprised how willing they are to work with you. You know, they really, they see a design engineer from their customer in their factory, uh, you know, you're gonna be treated like a, like a queen. You're gonna be treated uh, really, really well and get out and understand their processes, work with them, and, uh, and, and, and work with them on the design. But you have to get out, you know, because you've got to go to wherever they're going to be. And of course, nowadays, that could be all over the world. And, uh, and so I know it's not easy, it's maybe not traditional, but I believe the company that can really figure this out and, and, and really uh, do what I just said, uh, those companies will have a huge advantage uh, going forward. Uh, in their in their products, so so I'm, I'm very passionate about it. I used to be a supplier. I used I've been on all ends of this, so yeah. That, uh, uh, just get out there and work with the suppliers, and uh, and ask for their advice. Uh, have them build their prototypes for you on their production equipment, if possible. You know, not just over in a prototype area, but you know, see if they can do it right there in the machines, or that they're going to be making that part eventually in production. It really is a conundrum, isn't it? I mean, you have globally distributed supply chains, and then you hear our two esteemed panelists talking about the importance of quality and communication and linkage between design and manufacturing, uh, and how to, how to actually achieve that communication when you are so vastly distributed is a real conundrum. And technology, uh, you know, use technology, right? So you don't have to always be out there uh, you know, you can you can be looking at the same design on the screen and moving moving things around, moving uh, cutter paths around if you're in the machine shop business, that kind of thing. That can all be done uh, real time, which is great. You know, that that was something that wasn't available a few years ago. Great. So. Thank you, Kurt. Uh, anything to add there? No. Uh, any other questions from the audience? It looks like we have another here. Uh, this is a question for Dwayne. So you um, you work both on excuse me, <clears throat> the defense side, and now you're you're in industry, uh, and at least in other sectors, because of the um, of the budgetary constraints, defense is, is having to work uh, closer to industry, um, and therefore there, there seem to be many lessons to be learned on both sides. So can you comment on that as it pertains to? The, the way supply chains work on the private sector vis-a-vis -vis what the government does for uh, on the procurement side and within their own uh, supply chain? Yeah, we probably don't have enough time to go through all that, but, uh, <clears throat> but you know, it is, it is fascinating um, to, to see the difference. Um, I think that uh, the, uh, you know, on the defense side, there's uh, much more prescribed um, as to uh, uh, the specifications are perhaps a little bit more detailed uh, as, to, uh, uh, as to how products are made. Uh, a lot of times the products get developed in some skunk work or some, some other place, right? Mm -hmm. You know, in the defense side, whereas the commercial side, maybe not quite as much. And so uh, it's, um, I would say this, I would say that it's, uh, uh, it's not that one, one isn't better than the other. Um, I think that uh, uh, the aerospace side is, uh, uh, probably has a little bit more opportunity uh, to do a few more creative things I've seen than, than maybe on the defense side because by the time you get into the manufacturing phase on the defense side, uh, it, uh, some things are locked in. That's why it's so important to try to lock it in early in the design phase. Whereas in the aerospace side, you might have a little bit more latitude to go change some things. 
um, you know, a little bit later in the design. Not an excuse not to do it up front, but you have a little bit more latitude to go make those changes a little later in the design. Those are some of the things that I've, I've seen in the year that I've been in, the, in aerospace. Well, Kurt, Dwayne, I want to thank you both for sprinkling a little of your wisdom on us this morning. And we're very grateful for your participation and thank AIAA for this great opportunity. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.